My name is Pete Sloan. I'm a pulmonary and critical care physician in Baltimore, Maryland. Today I will discuss the evaluation of lactic acidosis outside the critical care setting. The impetus for this discussion is that in late 2015, our hospital, MedStar Union Memorial Hospital, which is part of MedStar Health, a large health system in the Baltimore, Washington region, started an initiative aimed at early detection and intervention of patients with sepsis syndrome. This program leverages our system's electronic health record to identify patients that may have systemic inflammatory response syndrome by monitoring a combination of laboratory parameters such as white blood count or clinical parameters such as vital signs. And when criteria are met, the protocol fires in order for the nurse to check a lactic acid level. If that level returns out of range, then the sepsis response team is notified and intervenes diagnostically or therapeutically and even triages the patient if appropriate. We are hoping that this program will ultimately translate to lower morbidity and mortality from sepsis syndrome at our institution and health syndrome, health system. The goals of today's talk are for you to understand the clinical significance of an elevated serum lactate level, appreciate the importance of recognizing sepsis syndrome early to help provide, prevent progression, for you to recognize clinical markers of tissue hyperperfusion and organ dysfunction, and ultimately to improve outcomes in our patient population by recognizing and intervening early in sepsis syndrome. Sepsis occurs in a continuum. Patient starts with an infection, and when systemic inflammation is present, we have sepsis syndrome. Severe sepsis is defined as sepsis with organ dysfunction, and septic shock is defined as either refractory shock to or fluid resuscitation or shock state requiring pressures to normalize blood pressure. Severe sepsis and septic shock can progress to mul multiple organ failure, in which case the patient can either progress to death or improve towards resolution. There are two factors that help choose the pathway the patient may go down. First factor is patient factors such as age, immune status, or comorbidities. And the second factor are disease factors such as the virulence of the infecting organism. These two factors are out of clinician's control for the most part. However, treatment is under our control, and for the purposes of this talk, we'll really talk about the timing of the treatment rather than specifics of the treatment, especially the notion that early treatment can help improve this situation and move towards resolution rather than bad outcomes. Let's define systemic inflammatory response as a widespread, dysregulated, deleterious inflammatory response to a variety of severe clinical insults, often leading to organ dysfunction. The clinical insults can be sepsis syndrome, but can be non-infectious, such as pancreatitis, trauma, or multiple blood transfusions. We further define systemic inflammatory response syndrome by its effect on the human body, and when several of these parameters are met, we can make a confident diagnosis of systemic inflammatory response syndrome. General parameters include elevation or low temperature, change of mental status, positive fluid balance, or abnormal liver function tests. Inflammatory parameters used to define SIRS are elevated or low white blood count, immature forms, elevated C-reactive protein or procalcitonin levels, hemodynamic pra parameters such as shock state, or tachycardia, pulmonary parameters such as hypoxia or tachypnea, renal parameters such as oliguria or rising creatinine, and coagulation parameters. Finally, evidence of tissue hyperperfusion is used in the definition of systemic inflammatory response, including elevated lactic acid, which is the topic of today's talk, or decreased capillary refill or modeling of the skin. So what's under the hood with sepsis? Bacterial cell wall have lipopolysaccharides, which can be endotoxins from gram-negative bacteria or exotoxins from gram-positive bacteria. 
these chemicals incite a reaction in our cells, such as macrophages and T cells, to dump out inflammatory mediators into the tissues and bloodstream, such as tumor necrosis factor or interleukins and other cytokines. These inflammatory mediators are the direct cause of systemic inflammation and a generalized capillary leak. leak. Now let's talk about lactic acidosis. As most of us are aware, we normally exercise and burn energy aerobically through glycolysis, where glycogen is converted to glucose and then glucose is converted to pyruvic acid. If there's sufficient oxygen, not only is ATP produced, but the pyruvic acid is converted to CO2 and, and water, which are harmless byproducts of metabolism. However, in the absence of oxygen, pyruvic acid can't be converted to CO2 and water and instead is converted to lactic acid, a toxic byproduct of anaerobic metabolism. Elevation of lactic acid lowers pH, lowers serum bicarbonate levels, and raises anion gap. Anion gap is the difference between the major cation, sodium, and the two major anions, chloride and bicarb. A normal anion gap is 5 to 14. Since lactic acid or sodium lactate has a sodium which is included in the anion gap calculation, but a lactate which is not part of the calculation of anion gap, each 1 milligram percent elevation of lactic acid would be expected to raise the anion gap by the same 1 milligram percent. Patients with acute lactic acidosis require urgent evaluation. We should be thinking about three etiologies of lactic acid production. First, systemic production from generalized tissue hyperperfusion, especially in patients who are hypotensive, require pressors, have new organ dysfunction, such as oliguria, optundation, or skin modeling. Second, we should consider local production, such as ischemic extremities, for which we should be checking for cold extremities, looking for pulses, and if necessary, Doppler ultrasounding for pulses, or ischemic bowel. The bowel is an engine of lactic acid production, and when ischemic, can cause incredible rise in lactate levels. In any patient with lactic acidosis, we should be examining the patient for abdominal pain and tenderness or rigidity, and looking for guarding, bloody stools, or diarrhea. Finally, there are other causes of lactic acidosis, such as after a seizure from increased muscle activity, some medications, for example, metformin in the presence of renal failure, and lymphoma, which can cause a special type of lactic acidosis known as type D lactic acidosis. In summary, lactic acidosis may be an early manifestation of SIRS or sepsis, Early recognition of lactic acidosis can help lead to early diagnosis and intervention in patients with sepsis syndrome. Early intervention may prevent progression to severe sepsis syndrome, septic shock, multiple organ dysfunction syndrome, or death. And most importantly, any patient with a significant elevated or rising lactate level requires urgent evaluation as to the cause of the acidosis and early institution of the treatment of the root cause of the acidosis. So it's critical to review patients with possible SIRS, early sepsis, or lactic acidosis with the patient's physicians or with the sepsis response team. I thank you very much.